let me start a sermon by saying this. Every society and culture uses symbolism and has various diverse sets of symbols. Yesterday, I had the great privilege of officiating a wedding between Jason and Sarah Liu. Weddings are full of symbolism, aren't they? But perhaps the most important symbol in any wedding is the wedding ring, right? The ring represents the lasting love and commitment of the couple to each other. We even have those special vows. They can be very traditional. You know them with this ring, I thee wed. We all know that phrase. And we all know what it means to have a ring on your left ring finger. See, symbols can be powerful reminders of deep truths that we cherish. But they only have such power in as much as they are understood and they're practiced. When I was in China, I quickly discovered that not many married couples actually wore rings. And those that did, it didn't seem to have as much uh, meaning to them because it didn't have the deep tradition. It wasn't part of their culture in the same way it is here. See, if we want symbolic items and acts to have value, we must constantly remind ourselves of their meaning and their importance. So getting to us, as Christians, there are no greater symbolic acts that we cherish than the ordinances, which are baptism and the Lord's Supper. If we allow their meaning to be, become unclear to us, they too will lose some of their power to move us and to help us. So we must always keep them before us. We are in a sermon series right now called Devoted to Fellowship. And this morning, we're going to look at how communion is related to our fellowship with one another. We're going to do that by looking at that primarily that short passage that Frank already read for us, but actually we're going to cover large sections in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. So we're not going to get down to a lot of detail, but my goal in covering this wider scope of passage is to demonstrate for us how vital fellowship is in communion. And then after we do that, we're going to finally celebrate communion together. Now, we haven't done this since COVID-19 first broke out. So I am sure that this is going to be a meaningful and an exciting and joyful day for us. But before we get, in, get there, let's just ask for God's blessing in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow ourselves before you in thankfulness. God, be with us today. We're so glad for the celebration that is before us. Deepen our understanding of all that is intended in communion. Be with me, Lord, as I seek to open up your scriptures. I am unequal to the task, but God, by the power of your spirit, may you bring power and depth to your word and bless it to each one of our hearts. Not only that we may grow in appreciation for the gospel, but that we may grow in appreciation for this very practice that Christ himself gave us. So, Lord, bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we're going to go through, as I said, large sections of 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. We're not going to get down to a lot of detail. But um, before we can kind of get into this, we need to get a little bit of a context. And that comes from the beginning of 1 Corinthians 10. See, the Corinthians had apparently become confident in their, their uh, destination of going to heaven because they took the ordinances. They'd been baptized and they took communion. So they figured we're all good. We're safe. But you see, that isn't how it works. Paul is going to use an example from the Old Testament to warn them that the ordinances do not save us. They only represent salvation. So in verses one and five, he goes back to the Israelites leaving Egypt and heading to the promised land. And he makes some comparisons. He says, just like they were under the cloud of the presence and they passed through the Red Sea, it's kind of like they were baptized. And just like they took the bread from heaven and the water from the rock, it's kind of like they took communion. So his point is, even though every single Israelite participated in these ordinance-like experiences, still they came under God's judgment and very, very few of them, only a handful, actually made it into the promised land. Many died in the wilderness. 
See, despite the fact that they were part of that experience, they still went through God's wrath and punishment. They didn't receive mercy because of their participation in these experiences, but they received punishment because of the rebellion and sin, both in their hearts and in their actions and choices. And that's an example to us. We don't get a free pass just because we've been baptized. We don't get our sins forgiven because we take the elements today. It isn't, that isn't what saves us. See, it's just representing what saves us in Christ. If you take the symbols without the reality that those symbols are pointing to, what you're practicing is completely meaningless, right? So if you get baptized and you take communion, but you don't have a saving faith, you haven't put your trust in Christ's death on the cross for your sins, you know what you've done? You've got wet at a church and you've had a snack at a church and it has no more meaning beyond that. In fact, it's almost a farce. It becomes meaningless when you take the symbols, but you lack the reality those symbols point to. It's almost like if a single person takes a wedding ring and they put it on their finger, that does not make them married. In the same way, these symbols only have meaning if the reality is already there in our lives. So we see as we come to verse 14 and 15, that Paul is going to give them a stern warning, seeing that these aren't a protection, these aren't our means of salvation. He says to them, therefore, my brothers, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. See, idolatry is a serious sin in which we elevate and worship something as equal or even greater to God himself. Now, today, most of us aren't going to have little shrines and statues in our rooms or in our homes or going to temples to visit them, but we still might struggle with idolatry, at least in the metaphorical sense. We might struggle with putting things before God. Our priorities can come quickly backwards, and we can worship these things in our hearts, even if we might not be praying prayers to them. What might that be? Well, it might be things like our careers. It might be things like our finances, like our comfort, like our pleasure, and so many other things. And Paul warns us to not even play games with that kind of thing, to do not, never for a minute, allow our priorities or our attitudes to put something else before God, but instead we're to flee it, to run in the absolute opposite direction. If we see just even an inkling of this, we're to get away from it in our lives. Because idolatry is a great sin before God. But if we look at the context of what Paul is talking about, he's not talking about metaphorical idolatry. He's actually talking about literal idolatry. Some of these Corinthians, he's later going to argue, have been literally worshiping idols because they've been going to these feasts that are dedicating to the the, the idols. And they've been taking part in them. They've been eating the food at those feasts. See, when you worshipped an idol and you sacrificed to an idol, you didn't just do nothing with the animal that you sacrificed. You threw a feast. You ate the animal. And you invited friends and you invited family. And you'd have this feast in the temple. And you'd celebrate your God as you ate eat this really delicious food. And now when you think about their diet back then, they, they probably didn't have as much meat in their diet as we do today. And so that would have been really good eating at these idol feasts. Not only that, even stronger, it was a social norm. So this was a way that they maintained their relationships with their family members. Uh, You got invited by your uncle to go to the idol feast. You better go with friends at their jobs. That was a big part of being part of guilds. You had to go and worship the idol of that guild or even just to show you were a good citizen. Good citizens worship the gods. There would have been a lot of pressure on these Corinthians to go to these idol feasts. When we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we were in China, we saw this in a different way with some of our young converts. They uh, really struggled with business dinners. You see, from our experience in China, business dinners often involved a lot of alcohol because they believed that when you got drunk with each other, you showed your true self. It was a means, when you got drunk with them, it was a means to show you they really trusted each other. Very often in business, that was the means that they would seal the deal with one another. 
And believers who didn't want to practice that faced a great deal of pressure from their employers to, to, to give in and to do it. And they had a really hard time with it. No doubt that's similar to what these believers in Corinth are struggling with, with these idol feasts. They're having a hard time with it. And based on what Paul writes next in verse 19, we can kind of guess the kind of justifications they were using in their heads to excuse their presence at these idol feasts. They were saying things like, ah, the idols aren't real. We all know they're false gods. So what's it matter if we go? We're not going to pray to the God. We're just going to have a meal. What's the big deal? When they pray to their God, we'll pray to our God. It's not, we're not really worshiping, right? Well, in Paul is going to use two arguments to prove them wrong. And he's going to use analogies from communion. For our purposes this morning, we're not so much trying to convince you that you shouldn't eat at idol feasts, although you shouldn't. Instead, I want to use the arguments for us to learn a lot about communion itself. So let's look at what he writes. In verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says this. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? The cup of blessing and the bread we break are clearly references to communion, right? So he's talking about communion. And you won't be too surprised to hear that the word participation is the same word we've been studying in our sermon series on fellowship. He's saying that they're having participation or fellowship with the blood and the body of Christ. Now, we remember that fellowship at its most basic sense is how believers all share in the life of Christ. So as we take communion, we are symbolically picturing and affirming our salvation in him. We remember his body broken and his poured out blood made a new covenant between us and God. So we confess our sins, turning away from them, and we commit our lives to Christ and his death on the cross for us. We see that there is no salvation for us outside of his death and resurrection. We accept that, and that's pictured in communion. It isn't that we're getting saved all over again as if taking communion forgives our sins, but what we're doing is by doing the symbolic practice, we're applying afresh what it represents to our hearts. We're reminding ourselves in taking the elements. We remind ourselves that we have to spiritually feed on Christ. Just like our bodies need food to, to, for life, our souls need Christ and his salvation for our eternal life. And so here we see that this represents the, the death and resurrection of Christ. But as it says, fellowship, that means more than simply to commemorate or remember something. Fellowship is an experience, right? In taking the Lord's Supper, we're also having fellowship with our Lord. We meet him in a special way when we partake communion. Why do you think it's called communion? Because in the elements, we commune with Christ. We have a special experience of his presence as we take the elements in prayer and worship and in fellowship with him. So Paul is trying to show us here that we take communion in fellowship with Christ. If we miss that part, we're missing a core of what communion represents to us. Now, in context, Paul is actually arguing that if when we take the bread and we take the wine, we have fellowship with Christ, when those believers are going to those idol feasts and they're eating the food and they're drinking the drink, they're having fellowship with the idols, right? Even if those idols aren't real, those idols are wicked, and they come about through demonic influence. So in some way, in having fellowship through the meal, they are experiencing fellowship with demons. And that is certainly not okay. Paul continues his argument in the very, very next verse to make a further point. Verse 17, he says this, Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body for we all partake of the one bread. This is a slightly different argument. And this is a point about fellowship, I think, that often is missed on us. We just, we tend to forget this very important point. Um, it, see, we, communion isn't just a reinvigoration of our fellowship with Christ. It's also 
an expression of our fellowship with one another. See, as we partake of the same elements and we refresh and enjoy the benefits of our salvation at the same time, we do it together as a church. Paul sees significance in the fact that there's one loaf that they took from. Uh, he says that just as there's one loaf, Christ had one body that was broken for us, we too as a church are one body of Christ, and Christ is our head, right? We're the body of Christ. So we're united together in him. By the very actions that we're remembering, his death on the cross, that unites us. A loaf of bread. Instead, today, you're going to get something a little bit different than even before. You're going to get one of these little packages. And I'm going to explain to you later how we use these things. But did, when I grew up, I actually went to a little church, about 40, 50 people, and we actually had a loaf of bread. And one of the elders would come up in front of us all, and he'd break it apart in front of us. And then we'd all pass it, and we'd tear a piece off, and we'd take it. And then there was one cup of wine, not grape juice like today, it was actually wine, and we'd pass it around and take a sip. And there's something good about that. The good thing was when we saw that elder tearing open the bread, we remembered that Christ's body was broken for us. And as we passed around one loaf and one cup, we remembered that we were one in Christ. Now, having said that, don't worry, I'm not pushing that we move to that right now. I mean, even back then, this is, this is longer ago than I would care to admit. Even back then, it was a little bit uncomfortable when the person before you was coughing and hacking. Then they take a drink and they pass the cup to you. And you're like, God, thank you for this cup. And please don't let me get sick. And you take a sip and pass it along. Now, obviously, after COVID, we just simply can't, for health and safety, ever move back to that. I bring that point up, though, because in moving to this, we're losing some important symbolism as much as we have to do this. I want us to remember the deep symbolism of the oneness that is supposed to be communicated in communion. That's one of the reasons why we have it as one, at least together, in front of us here today. Now, unfortunately, if people online can't see that. I apologize for that. but. Um, what when we come to the Lord's table, we have to see that we take communion in fellowship with Christ and with Christ's church, with one another. It's not just an expression of our devotion to Christ personally. It's an expression of our unity with one another in him. Just as we have real communion with Christ in the elements, we should feel our real fellowship with our brothers and sisters as we take it together. Now, in context, what is Paul arguing here? Well, he's using that principle on communion to make a point. You see, if in taking fellowship together, we are expressing our unity with each other as brothers and sisters, when those believers went to those idolatrous feasts, even though the idols aren't real, they were also expressing their unity and eating together with them, with the pagan, re, re, the pagan worshipers. They're saying, we are united with you at this moment as we worship this, this, at this uh, pagan feast dedicated to your idol. And obviously, such a unity is absolutely inappropriate for believers. As Paul goes on in verse 21, he flat out says to them, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Look at what he calls it, the cup of demons. You cannot partake the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Paul doesn't play games with idolatry like we do. He's telling them straight up that God is not going to sit idly by as they unite themselves and, and obey and put pr as a priority these wrong things in their lives, no matter what their reasons might be, when, no matter what rationalizations or excuses they might have to do it, God will not sit idly by. He will not put up with it. He will discipline his children until they learn their lesson. And that's a warning for us. He says these things are written as examples for us. It's a warning for us. Don't take idolatry in our lives lightly. If you see it, repent of it and get your priorities right. Who is God? Let God be God and all other things second and after him. Now, 
if as we take communion, if you do find that you've been allowing idolatry to come into your life, I, I find that that comes in my life as well, too. We are sinners. That is an opportunity to repent of it and recommit ourselves to our Lord and Savior as we take communion. Paul is going to go on and he's going to talk about some other things, but then later in chapter 11, he's going to come back to communion. And so I want to look at it because um, there's some really instructive things that he's going to say there. So we're going to start in chapter 11, verse 17. I want to read this if you want to follow along. I'm reading in the ESV. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and 17, he says this, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because you come to get, because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. See, he's still talking about fellowship. And I believe in, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order to, that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. In this section, it's a little hard to understand because Paul is making some cultural assumptions that while the original audience would have understood really clearly, we can, we can get a little mixed up if we're not careful. I mean, it's obvious to us that he's discussing divisions in the church and he's talking about communion, but then he's talking about eating meals. And he's talking about people getting drunk in church. And we're wondering, what on earth is he going on about here? What is happening here in Corinth? Well, first of all, it appears that when the ancient church celebrated communion, they did it in the context of a communal meal together. We see a hint of this in uh, Jude verse 12 where it talks about something called love feasts, which we believe are these meals that they would eat just before they celebrated communion. And that makes a little bit of sense if you think about it, because Jesus instituted communion after the Passover feast. So he and his disciples ate a meal together, and then they did communion, right? So it isn't that we are commanded to do it that way, but we can understand why they would choose to do it that way, because eating a meal together further emphasizes fellowship that they share with one another. There's something about eating together that tends to bond people together, isn't there? You know, I, I sometimes think it would be interesting to, to celebrate communion in the sense of having a communal meal together too. I understand the logistics would be too complicated for a church our size, certainly these days, but wouldn't that be an interesting thing? In, in any case, I want to take a minute. I want to try to reconstruct the situation that Paul was speaking to in this slightly confusing passage that we just looked at. Well, Paul has already mentioned some theological divisions that have been going on earlier in Corinthians. What he's probably referring to here are economic divisions, divisions between the rich and the poor that he references just a few verses later. Um, you see, in the ancient church, this is another fact we need to be clear on, they didn't celebrate on Sunday morning. Almost certainly it was Sunday evening because uh, workers and slaves didn't get Sunday off because they were Christians. So at the end of the day, after they worked hard, they would come together and celebrate after they got off their jobs. We see that in Acts chapter 20. When Paul is preaching, he preaches till midnight, not because he started in the morning, because he started late. And then Eutychus, if you'll remember, is sleepy, sitting upstairs, and he actually falls asleep and falls out the window, and Paul heals him. It turns out okay. But the reason he fell asleep and the reason Paul preached to midnight is because they had their, their meetings after the day's work. The guy was tired, and then he preached long all the way to midnight. So anyway, that's the context. They are meeting together late after work. But that probably means, based on what we read, that they're not arriving at the same time. You see, if you were a slave or a common laborer, you would get off much later than the average person. So the more wealthy people and the rich who own their own businesses, they could be flexible with their time. They chose their own schedules and they could arrive early. And apparently they were, and they were beginning to eat this feast 
probably the meal that they had at church was provided by the rich people anyway, because the poor people probably couldn't afford to pay for it. So the rich people were providing it, and they just began kind of tucking in and getting to the meal, and they're drinking, and they're eating, and they're even eating so much that they're stuffed. They're drinking so much that they get drunk. What on earth are they doing? Is there no reverence? They're treating it like a feast dedicated to an idol. That's what they did in those feasts, that they had been attending at these idol feasts. They're attending communion. They're treating it like that. They're just partying. They're eating a lot. They're drinking a lot. And so much so that there's nothing left. When these slaves and these poor folks finally arrive, they've eaten everything. They've drank everything. And they're left to go hungry without the means to provide for themselves. Pretty remarkable, if that's actually what's happening. I mean, no wonder. Paul says to them in verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you may eat. You may call it the Lord's Supper, but that doesn't count. He's disgusted by their behavior. I mean, look at it. The Lord's Supper is supposed to represent our fellowship with one another. They had this wonderful opportunity before them to demonstrate fellowship. These rich folks could have demonstrated their, un your, their unity and their love for the poor brothers and sisters by providing a nice meal for them to sustain them as well. But they didn't do that. Instead, they were only thinking of themselves as they eat it, almost like they're treating God like they treat an idol. And as they had no consideration for their brothers and sisters in the communion celebration, Paul says, it isn't even dignified, it isn't even worth being called the Lord's Supper, what you're doing. You see, he realizes what they don't. He realizes that when we take a communion, we have to take it not just in fellowship with God, like it's some kind of a personal devotion between you and your God. Sometimes we do it like that. This is just me and you, God, and I'm going to take this. This is just about me and you. It isn't just about you and God. It's about you and God and the church God has brought you into. The brothers and sisters, he has united you with through the blood of Christ. And when we take it with no consideration for others, we are missing and making a mockery of part of what it represents. I mean, look at what Paul does here. You can't read it, but those yellow parts are showing us five different times in just this short little passage when he says to them completely unnecessarily, he says to them, five times when you come together, 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 you're together having communion. Are you forgetting that? It isn't a private exercise. It's an exercise of the church united. So when you come together, you are doing it in fellowship with your brothers and sisters. Think about them, recognize and respect them, have unity with them. Don't just eat it all without them. And so he moves on because they've missed part of the key symbolism of the, the elements themselves. He moves on and says to them in verse 33 through 34, so then, brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about other things. I will give you directions when I come. In other words, he's saying to them, listen, rich folks, if you arrive early, just wait, be patient for your brothers and sisters. And then if you're really famished, eat something at home, leave food for them, make sure that happens. And then remember, it's not a personal devotion, but as you take it together, equal before God, rich aren't better than poor before God, equal before God, all of us needy sinners, you take it in a beautiful communion, both with Christ and with those we are united with in his blood. See, it isn't about the meal. It's about the unity in eating together as a church. So Paul confronts what they're doing wrong, and then he lays out the way it should be done in what follows in verses 23 through 26. He says this, for I, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, oh, let me get that advance, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, 
you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So in this section, Paul goes over how Christ instituted communion at, the, at first, at the Passover, that first communion meal. And it strikes me, and you probably heard this before, that communion has a past, a present, and a future element to it, doesn't it? See, we look back and we think of Christ's death and how he suffered on the cross for us in the past. In the present, we experience communion with him and with our brothers and sisters. But verse 26 adds another thing, that as we take these elements together, we are actually proclaiming the gospel. See, it pictures the gospel in the elements. And as we take it, we're telling the world, we believe that salvation is only found through Christ's broken body and poured out blood. And now he resurrects and reigns on high. We have repented of our sins. We put our faith in him. And if you want a hope for eternity, you must do the same. We are going to feed on Christ. And we invite you to join us if you believe first. So the gospel proclamation goes out to the world, but it's not just for unbelievers. We are taking it, proclaiming it to our own selves because we're quick to forget it. We're quick to stray, and we remind our hearts, and we, we preach the gospel to ourselves. But as we take it together, we are having that fellowship as one another. We're saying we're all doing this together. We're in the same boat. Each one of us declares our need of a Savior. And then finally, there's a future aspect as well. As um, he says, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. See, we're not going to celebrate communion in heaven. Of course we're not, because we will have the reality that communion points to. Communion is but a foretaste of all that awaits us in heaven. It's a promise of what is to come. More literally, and I'm not going to get into the details, but it's a foretaste of the marriage supper of the Lamb that we would read about in Revelation 19. We just don't have time. But it's sort of this foretaste of a table that God sets before us and it hosts for us, invites us to come to and says, I will care for you. Not just now, right now, but I will care for you forever one day. So communion looks back at Christ's death. It looks in the presence, communion with our Father, communion with one another, proclaiming the gospel to ourselves and others. And it looks forward to the day that we will be with him forever. Now, we're going to come very soon to a time of taking communion. I'm sure you've been anxious for it. So have I. We need to prepare our hearts to take communion. And Paul actually, in the very next section, talks about doing that. So I want to take a couple hints from Paul about how we can do this. So I'm going to read verses 27 to 32. It says this. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we, if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. See, communion is a solemn ordinance. And God disciplines us when we take it in an unworthy manner. So how can we avoid this? Well, Paul calls us to examine ourselves. And, and we're supposed to, in this examination, make sure we are discerning the body. And we want to talk about what that means right now. Well, at minimum, discerning the body means recognizing that Jesus died on the cross for you. So it, it means that you should not take the elements if you're not a believer. That's like wearing a wedding ring. If you're single, it becomes a meaningless thing, a bit of a mockery of all that it represents. So communion is reserved for believers alone. In fact, here at our church, we believe that communion should be reserved for baptized believers. I'm not going to get into it, but um, baptism is your first declaration, public declaration of your faith in Christ. Communion is your repeated public declaration of your, um, your salvation in Christ. It doesn't make sense to do the repeated action before you do your first action. So we ask that people would be baptized first, and then you can take communion. So communion at minimum is for baptized believers. But I think there's something more involved here too. We're called to examine ourselves, and I believe that's to examine ourselves for sin. 
See, the Holy Spirit is going to put his finger on some sin in your lives. And the call here is for you to repent of those sins. And by repent, I don't just mean, sorry, I'm probably going to do it again, but I'm sorry, so I can take this. Repent means to really genuinely want to turn your back on it with the power and help of the Spirit, to, to, be, to really grieve over it, to repent of those sins and recommit your life to Christ. Communion, in that case, acts as a beautiful reminder of the forgiveness that is purchased for us through Christ. However, if you are unwilling to repent, Christ puts his finger on a sin in your life and you're like, you know what, God, I love that more than I love you. I'm committed to that more than I love you. And I'm committed to you. First of all, that's an idolatry. Whatever it is, that's an idolatry. And don't think that you can have, idol you can have a commitment to that idol and then also commitment to Christ. You can't. It's one or the other. And so if you're unwilling to repent, don't take it. You would be making a mockery of it. And you'd be taking it in an unworthy manner and be guilty concerning the body and blood and be under the discipline of God. A worse discipline than you would be just allowing that sin in your life. So get yourself right with God. If you're sitting there thinking you can play games with repentance, don't. We all mess up. We do it all the time. We have besetting weaknesses and sins, but repent of them and commit yourself once more. Repent of them and commit yourself once more, trusting that Christ can strengthen you by the Spirit to overcome those sins in your life. Do not love the sin more than you love your Savior. So, um, I want to suggest one further thing. We examine ourselves, we discern the body of Jesus who died on the cross, but as we've looked at the context, we've seen that a lot of this has been about fellowship with one another. And he, he says, when you eat and drink, but he doesn't say discern the body and the blood. He doesn't say the body of Jesus. He just kind of leaves it a little vague. And I think he intends a double meaning. We don't just discern the body of Christ broken on the cross. We discern the body that is Christ's church. We take communion in unity together. And so if you've got a grudge against someone else, now is the time, a brother or sister in Christ, it is the time to forgive and let go as you prepare your heart. To, to bring it before Christ, to remember that you are an imperfect sinner yourself, that you need forgiveness, and so give forgiveness to others. So as communion is an expression of our unity, we must take it in recognition that we are the body of Christ because to, be, be, together because of the death that we are remembering in the elements. We're united. This is not a personal devotion. It is a communal devotion as the body of Christ. So we are going to take communion in fellowship with Christ and the church. So in a minute, we're going to pass out these elements. I know I keep saying that, but I mean it for sure this time. In a minute, we're going to pass out these elements, but I, we're going to, before we take, they're going to be passed out. And before we take, we're going to have a moment of silence. In that moment, I want you to do some heart work. I want you to do some praying before God. And I want to give you a suggestion. I read this from uh, Bobby Jameson about how you might prepare your heart. And I really liked what he said, so I want to share it with you. It's pretty brief. He said, start off and look to the cross and remember what Jesus did for you there. And then look around. Look at the brothers and sisters that you were united with, and God has given you the privilege and joy of sharing this communion together with. Then look ahead. Look at all that the cross has given you, the promise of eternity with him, the anticipation it gives us. Then look inward, find those sins, confess and repent them, and then look back to the cross and preach the gospel to yourself. Once more, apply the truths of the gospel, accepting that salvation that you have received through Christ.